Hello, creative people. Welcome to Creative Conversations. My name is Hollis Citron, and we are so happy that you have chosen to spend your time with us. I am owner and founder of I Am Creative and Express Yourself Publishing, and I am on a mission to expand the definition of creativity beyond a pencil and a paintbrush and to empower people, especially adults, to own their voices and talents that come in so many different forms. This space was created to talk to people with all different kinds of jobs, hobbies, and interests, and to have conversations about experiences and perspectives all centered around three questions. How do you define creativity? How do you incorporate it into your life? And why do you think it's important? Then we have a free-flowing conversation and we see where it goes. So I have had the opportunity to speak to so many. I've spoken to musicians, comedians, doctor, lawyer, wrestlers, Reiki masters, and entrepreneurs as young as 13. And these conversations explore the reality that creativity is not cute, it is necessary. People have defined creativity as that magic spark, how we show up in our life, imagination, basically all that we are and want to be, do, or have. So I believe from my heart that sharing these stories gives one the ability to expand their thinking, open themselves up for more self-expression, to feel more empowered, connected, and dare I say, happy. So my inspiring guest for today is Peggy McCartha. She is a certified professional photographer with over 34 years of experience. She's known as the most industry savvy headshot photographer in Los Angeles, leveraging the same strategies that she uses to help actors get noticed in the corporate world to help business people take charge of their first impressions and attract their ideal clients. Peggy, welcome to the space. Hi, sorry about that. It, it, yeah. Anyway, we're here now. That's what matters. <laughs> we are here. How are you, Miss Peggy? I am doing so good. I'm so excited to be on your podcast today. Oh, thank you. I'm so excited to talk to you and for people to get to know you. So we only have an hour, so we're going to dive right in. And before we even learn more about you, do you have any kind of a fun fact that you would like to share with us? Oh my gosh, I hate this question. Okay. I know. It's kind of annoying at times, <laughs> but I found really good answers. I, I mean, I'm I'm horrified of Bigfoot. I grew up in a small town, like 21 people in my graduating class. I, I don't know. I don't I don't know. <laughs> that's really good. Wait, what what did you say about Bigfoot? He that's like my biggest fear. Bigfoot. Bigfoot and I have a long history. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. You can't just leave us at that. Come on. Okay. So give me, give us just like a little bit more on that. <laughs> so my sisters are nine and 11 years older than me. So, you know, growing up in the seventies, you know, parents just left their children to themselves. Right. And so my sister always, you know, got stuck babysitting me. And I don't know, I was four or five when that movie Bigfoot came out and my sister was supposed to be watching me, but she had a date with a boy and they went and saw that movie Bigfoot. So they made me sit by myself in the movie theater <laughs> <laughs> and I got so scared. And then, and then like my whole life, like I like really thought like Bigfoot was chasing me multiple times. And Aww. then, um, I lived on the Navajo Indian Reservation for 12 for 12 years. And when we first moved there, um, I lived out in the middle of nowhere, no phone lines. We didn't even have running water. And there was this little ridge. And of course, everyone was like, yeah, Bigfoot runs through here. It's like, really, you have to like, and I was home alone. And like every night, um, I would see this big thing like over the, the ridge. And finally, after the third night, I just went out the front door and I was like screaming. I was like, fine, come, come get me, Bigfoot. <laughs> and it was this big brown fuzzy dog. Um, so, but yeah, it's, it's a real thing. My family teases me uh, about Bigfoot all the time. Um, but yeah, I, I do have a, a probably irrational fear of Bigfoot. It's <laughs> <laughs> Well, wait, okay. And then we're going to move on. How old were you when she took you to see this movie? like four or five okay, but it's so, like I, i'm yeah. much older than that now and i still like you know i don't go into foresty areas because yeah. i feel like 
a bear is not going to bother me, but Bigfoot may actually come and attack me. So, <laughs> But those are the formative years. Those are the things when things really get sunk in, whether it's right? rational or not. I completely understand. I admit, everybody, I still run up the steps from the basement. <laughs> and I am 55 years old. Like, right. I'm still like, yeah, because I was always freaked out by the basement. I would hear things, see things, da da da. da. And yeah, I still I still run up the steps. <laughs> so <That's> funny. <laughs> so everybody, what's your what's your fear? <laughs> <laughs> so okay, we're gonna dive right in and I want to welcome those here with us live. Thank you so much for being here. Please, any questions or comments, please feel free to put them in the chat box so you can be part of the conversation. Okay, so Ms. Peggy, first official question is, how do you define creativity? So when you told me that was going to be a question you asked me, I, I really like thought, how do you define, like on the surface, that seems like such an easy uh, question because... I mean, I feel like I'm a creative person, right? I, I'm a photographer. My whole life I've been creative. But I really, I, I really spent some time on this. And, mm -hmm. and I'm going to say that the way that our brains connect things, the way they've never been connected before um, or differently than they've ever connected before is really what creativity is. It's kind of our perception of how we see the world it's it's kind of the process of creating the you know creativity i think could be defined that way mm, i love that i love that the way our brains connect things differently than ever than they ever did before and it's our perception yeah i think that i mean i'm a color nerd you know like color fascinates me and one of the things I learned years and years ago is that everyone sees color differently. Like what I perceive as blue, your brain may perceive it differently, but it's blue to you, but we may not be seeing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I just think that's crazy um, when, you, when you think about the world that everybody kind of sees everything a little bit differently. Well, isn't that what's amazing? I mean, when you really take time to think about it, and just not even think, just be aware of it is, is that, you know, it's based off, like you said, the word perception. So it's our perspective. This is why when things happen and they ask people, well, what did you see? And what happened? People see different things <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because we're connected with different stories. We perceive things in different ways. We pick up on certain cues or things that have more meaning to us or whatever. So it's not just this non-personal thing of what you're seeing. But I'd love that you also said this too, because being a photographer, it's like our eyes being our lens. Mm -hmm. And our eyes being our lens will focus in on certain things it's never the same thing. If you, if, if we're looking at a flower and every, and you're like, look at the flower, well, people are going to notice different parts of the flower. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. What is it about the flower that you notice versus what is it that, that I notice? Mm -hmm. And I, I appreciate you bringing in that idea of color. That is, that's a really cool fact, actually. <laughs> It'll drive you nuts when you like spend too much time thinking on it, but um, but yeah, I go down that color route because, you know, I'm, I'm very, colors have emotions and how you, you know, how you feel with different colors. I'm always, you know, nerding out on things like that. <laughs> no, but I think it's really interesting. I did a, um, an activity when I was teaching art in the classroom. I, um, one of the activities I did in elementary school, you can really do it with any age, but uh, we were talking about emotion and color. And it was just kind of like a quick activity where I would just say the color and, or I would say an emotion and then they would grab a crayon and fill in whatever color or colors they felt associated with that. Uh -huh. So it's just interesting to see what people pick. Certain right. things, there's a commonality, but other things there isn't. Like black isn't always a sad color. And red isn't always love. 
Reg could be anger. Reg could be love. Like it's, you know, it's pretty, pretty opposites. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really like our stories and our perceptions. It's like, you know, I think that's going to be like a common theme throughout things. It's, it's just really interesting to see. And people with the kids who got really engaged with that. And it was just cool for me to see from an outsider to be like, oh, okay. So we're going to go probably told you a lot about probably told you a lot about them and how they they identify as a human too. It does. It does. It, it really kind of in a very quick glance kind of helps reinforce or kind of see their stories uh -huh. a little bit. And it can be very telling where in the in the sense of like a deeper conversation. Oh, really? You know, red is happy. I love that you see red is happy do you wear red or, you know, some kind of deeper conversation and um, it'd just be really interesting. The things that you could find out yeah, without asking those questions, right. you know, that is interesting. I always think that I have this thing that I think that colors pick us. We don't pick our favorite colors. I think that, you know, when we were small, we saw a color that made us feel a specific way. And that's why we're drawn to, you know, that's how, why we have favorite colors. Um, I don't know. You probably so, didn't ask me on here to nerd out about colors. No, I did. This is, this is a, <laughs> a free-flowing conversation. Okay, and this good. is what I love about these because it's just like seeing where things go. So interesting. So you're saying that this is something that we relate to in childhood and then we kind of carry it through? That's my idea. I, I mean, I, I have no science behind this. I just, yeah. this is... You know, watching my own kids, watching, you know, other people's kids and and just asking, like, what's your favorite color? How long has that been your favorite color? And I just wonder if, like, you know, a, as a child, you gravitated to a specific color because you needed that emotion that that color, you know, provided you that emotional feeling, whether it be trust or comfort or, you know, excitement. Ooh. Ooh, love that. I really do. It's interesting. You just made me think of, so our son, when <laughs> we still have like one of his books from like when he was three or four years old in his uh, nursery school kind of thing. And they asked what his favorite color was. And it's like darkest blue or darkest green. <laughs> it was the response. And um, yeah, yeah. And he still... He still does like those darkest blue, at least it's um, yeah. pa painting his room. Like he's still darkest blue is, is up there. Um, so now that you say that, I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody should study this. This is just my, uh, my uh, non-scientific uh, ideas. <laughs> well, it doesn't have to be based in science. Um, okay. So, I want to hear more about you, Miss Peggy. So I call this photographer who encourages, inspires, and educates. But if you could kind of take us on a journey, wherever you want to start in this, um, about who you are and um, how you got to where where you are. I know it's okay. kind of a broad question. But... That's, a, that's a really broad question. Um, I, I've been living for many, many years. So I got my first camera when I was nine years old for Christmas. Uh, my sister's husband gave me a camera and I just fell in love with it. Uh, my sister and my uncles did a lot of photography and I, I loved looking at pictures. My parents had um, National Geographic. They had like all the, the National Geographic's in order and the in the bookshelf downstairs and I would sit and, you know, again, I grew up in a really small town, didn't really have any culture or a lot of exposure to a lot of diversity. So I think I just would get lost in looking at the people and the animals and the landscapes and just was always really drawn to that. And I love taking pictures of people. Like as the second I got my camera, I loved photographing people. When I was 12, I um, saved up my babysitting money and my yard mowing money, and I bought my first 35 millimeter camera. Wow. And I drug that around with me everywhere with a notebook. And I would like write down like the exposure that I used, and you know, so that when I would get the film back 
people don't the younger generation listening to this are like what do you mean when you got your pictures back mm -hmm. yes we had to take the pictures send the film in mm -hmm. get it developed and they would send us prints back and mm -hmm. so i would you know i would look at my notes to see how you know what i needed to change and so i just always you know i never i never wanted to do anything but be a photographer um and uh so i grew up my my parents were self-employed so i i grew up in a environment where i wasn't expected to you know go to college and get a, a real job it was you know it, it wasn't ever anything that was ever pushed on me mm -hmm. um so i i I was able to do that, and uh, right after high school, I interned with a a really high end wedding photographer, and he taught me, you know, a lot of things. He was um, very eccentric, but mm -hmm. <laughs> so I credit him to a lot of the uh, the things that I that I know and how I understand how to work with people and how to pull out their emotions and. Um, and just how to, to run a business um, and, and things like that, that, that some really fun, fundamental things that he taught me. And uh, then, uh, I, like I said, I've, I've always been really fortunate to be able to um, make a living doing what I love. Now, I was, even though <laughs> that's all I've ever done, it wasn't until maybe 10 years ago that I started running my business like a business. I... I was just lucky enough to make enough money, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't really understand the business side of, uh, you know, I, I, people say, what's your, your one tip if you, if I want to be a professional photographer and my tip is take business classes mm -hmm. <laughs> because you're, you're running a business. And uh, I wish somebody would have told me that, you know, 30, 35 years ago is to take a business class, but I learned it, uh, the school of hard knocks. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of luck. Um, you know, I was I've I've always been able to to you know thrive and and have you know make a good living. Even though sometimes I I just think of all the money that I left laying on the table because I didn't know how to run a business. Um, all the money I wasted and all the opportunities that I didn't you know the open doors that I didn't step through because um, I didn't really understand business, but. You, know, you can't go back. Everything that happens makes you who you are, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it truly does. And it really is. Uh, it is a process. It's it's that contrast of like, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. <laughs> I don't want to do that anymore. This is what I've learned. And yeah, you're truly uh, in, in a business. And then you take the steps. Once you, it's kind of like you can't do what you don't know. Um, right. But I, I, I want to go back and I just want to hear a little bit more about, so when you were, I love that you shared, you're 12 years old, you saved up your money, you bought 35 millimeter. Um, and I have to say, my daughter is actually really into photography now. And I'm so excited that she's using, my dad was a photographer before he passed for a long time. And um, uh, she's using his camera and nice. she's using real film and she dropped it like it's coming back where there's places to drop mm -hmm. off the film and get it developed and the process like she's really excited about it um but is there i i really appreciate that you had a journal and you were kind of writing things down and teaching yourself was there anybody around that time that was a, a role model or a teacher for you or was it just you were teaching yourself I, I was pretty much teaching myself. Um, I uh, I would buy um, like photography magazines or you know photography books, and I would read them, and then I would go out and try it, and then you know look at you know back and forth, and um, so it was it was a lot of trial and error. Um, my dad taught me composition um, by holding up. I was really proud of this one picture that I took, and he held it up, and he like tipped it over to its side and he was like that's where my eyes went and then he just let go of it and it fell off <laughs> and then he walked off um so my dad was a man of few words but he always got his point across um, <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah so i uh, um you know really just drove people nuts like trying to learn how to pose you know my friends my my pets um, whatever it was, like I was always posing people and trying different things. 
Mm -hmm. So, okay. So talk to us. So I know that you people and headshots were like a really big thing for you. So, um, it's like a, you know, something you enjoyed and a place where you could really succeed in your business. So tell us a little bit about on the reservation when you started doing that, but then, or if you want to do that, or when you got to LA and, um, doing headshots for actors and everything. Well, it's, it's really actually funny. I used to not like headshots. I used to think that headshots were like, you know, a kid's job, like anybody can do that, whatever, like mm. no talent. It took, you know, set smile by, like I had no, I felt it was a waste of my talent. I was a <laughs> high end portrait photographer. Um, mm. I didn't bother my time with headshots. And, um, mm -hmm. um, like photograph of smile. Yeah. Next. I just, smile. I, Next. I, I was just like, you know, people love my work. They came to me because they love my work. And then when somebody would say, can you do a headshot? It was just like, <sighs> so beneath me. I would be like, mm -hmm. that's fine. And, <laughs> and I was living in San Diego at the time and uh, an actor called and said, can you, I'm an actor. I need headshots. Can you do headshots? And I was like, well, yeah, I can do headshots. Mm -hmm. And I did these headshots and they were beautiful. And uh, she came to look at him and she was like, well, these are terrible. I can't use them. And I can't remember um, in my like, yeah, when I was a kid, but in my professional years, when anybody told me they didn't like my work. So my ego was like super injured. I was like, what do you mean? They're beautiful. And she was like, these aren't headshots. I can't use them. And I was like, what in the world? And then that happened a couple of more times. And then I was like, no, I don't I don't want to do an actor's headshots. Um, but what ended up happening is I, I, I don't like failing. Um, I'm very stubborn. So I took an acting class, um, so I could understand what the heck a headshot was. Um, mm -hmm. so I took a, a business, an actor business class. Um, and I was like, Oh, wow, this is really interesting. Like they like create these characters and really show emotion. And then I, it became a challenge to me because instead of being able to pose and use hands and, you know, props, it was just, you know, chest up that you had to do all these amazing creative things. And uh, so I spent seven years interviewing casting directors, working actors, acting coaches. I had a podcast. That's all I did was talk for seven years um, and really defining, you know, what made a headshot pop, what made a headshot effective. Mm -hmm. And we would have actors come in and I, I use this as an example because it's 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 easy. You know, an actor would come in and like, I, I want I want to audition for an attorney. So we would go through like, what kind of an attorney? Um, are you a badass attorney? Or are you the guy that's like tripping over your briefcase on the way into court? Like, you know, what did you have for breakfast? How did that feel? You know, we really dive into all these emotions and get these great headshots. And then I would have an actual attorney come in and be like, cheese. And I was like, something's not adding up here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, the corporate, you know, we live in a digital di driven world. The corporate people need to use their headshot just like an actor uses their headshot to capture the attention of their potential clients. Mm -hmm. You know, actors use it to capture the attention of casting. And so I started really talking to my clients like who who are who are you marketing to who's your ideal clients what do they need to know about you and uh really started using that and then the pandemic happened mm -hmm. and i stood on my hands for nine months i just was out of my mind um not able to have clients or anything here in la we shut down pretty tight mm -hmm. and uh so i found myself on clubhouse doing consulting and I was doing some business uh, talking about marketing to business people, you know, via zoom and different conferences. Mm -hmm. And some, some guy in a conference goes, you're the headshot strategist. You should register that. And inside I was rolling my eyes like so hard. Mm -hmm. I thought that was just ridiculous. And then mm -hmm. that night I was laying in bed with my husband and I was like, you know, I should. And mm -hmm. three weeks later I had it registered and I had a standalone program. Um, developed and I started kind of trying it out with my actors I would get on zoom with them and go through this whole thing before 
they came into the studio. Normally, I would just do it as they were there. And they would come into the studio like prepared, ready to go. And the headshots were just on the next level. It was, I was like, wow, it made me look better. But just because they were so prepared. And so I was like, all right. So I kind of tweaked it and made it for, for corporate people and my entrepreneurs. And uh, so then uh, that kind of just people found out I was doing it. And people started calling me from all over the world. Um, to go through my headshot strategy program and then they were like and I was telling them now find a local photographer this is what you need to tell them and you know um, but people were saying can you recommend a photographer can you recommend a photographer and I was like no I don't know any photographers mm -hmm. so I thought well I'll do like a two-hour webinar or something and I'll teach photographers this and then I thought no if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it all the way. I'm going to teach photographers how to not only help their clients, but to help them learn how to market themselves and run their business like a business. So my little two hour webinar turned into a 26 course certification program. <laughs> God. So I, I don't know how to do things small, but <laughs> you know, I, I just feel like for me, I used to hate it when I would see photographers that weren't really talented but they were out there making money like they just bought a camera and they're you know just shooting on automatic and they're out there charging people as much as I'm charging them or more and I have all the experience and actually understand photography and it used to just drive me crazy I was like why are people paying well because they know business and they know marketing yeah so my goal is to help those photographers that are so talented at what they do, but they just aren't able to get the clients that they need. They just aren't able to run the business. So in this teaching them how to run a profitable business and mm -hmm. also give them this headshot strategy um, that can set them apart from other photographers in their area and help them really understand how to, to because every photographer as a headshot like whether we want to or not and all the things that you learn can be applied to any any kind of photography so it's it's just because that guy called me the headshot strategist that's why the program's named that <laughs> but it's oh my god there's so many questions i have it's like um okay so um first when you called yourself a high-end photographer um what does that mean? So what were you taking pictures of in being a high-end photographer? Mainly families. Um, mm -hmm. I specialized in maternity and baby's first year and mm -hmm. families. Um, I also worked with people with disabilities. Um, that was another one of my specialties. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's pretty much what I did every day, all day long. I used to shoot five days a week for about eight to ten hours a day. Um, I, I kept really busy and I had um, a very good clientele base that really I didn't have to market myself because it was so busy with word of mouth. Yeah. Uh, and uh, thankfully, because like I said, I, I didn't really understand. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, maybe 10 years ago is when I started realizing, oh, I'm really not run. I'm running my business just barely legal, let alone doing any of the other things that I should be doing. Well, it's kind of like that see a need, fill a need. It's, it's, I'll never forget that from the movie Robots, the kids movie Robots, a car animated movie. Um, it's kind of what you did. It's, you were like, see a need, fill a need for you. And if you're not the only one in needing this, you were like, this is because we are our own best clients. So it's like, I needed to know this. So I want to teach this to other people, which obviously there's a big market for, um, because there's that disconnect often, not always, but with the creatives and then the business. Um, and I kind of want to go back. I also am so impressed with the fact of your tenacity and you're like, okay, I don't understand this. So I'm going to take a, an acting class <laughs> and I'm going to learn this. And I'm going to talk to all these people about what makes a headshot you know, stand out and pop. Um, but I'm curious when in the beginning, when you took the headshots and you saw it as beautiful and the person, the actor or actress didn't, 
Do you know what the disconnect was? Yes, I was taking portraits. I was making a beautiful picture that anyone's grandma or mom would have loved to have. And that's not the purpose of a headshot. A headshot, mm -hmm. um, when used for business or for any, you know, if it's used on your your portfolio, uh, your uh, your profile picture rather, is, mm -hmm. you know, on your social media, on your website, your business card, wherever it's used, it's your first impression that you're making on people. People mm -hmm. don't need to know if you're beautiful. They don't need to know that your hair is perfect. They need to know that you're trustworthy. Maybe they need to know that you are approachable. Maybe they need to know that you're professional, but they don't need to know that you look beautiful. That is not mm -hmm. one of the qualifications for working with you. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we all want to look our best. I'm not saying that, that you know, we don't do, you, you know, don't go get a beautiful picture, uh, yeah. but you have to, it has to convey emotion. It has to tell that person at a glance um, studies say that less than one second people decide if they are interested or not interested. That means if they're scrolling through a whole bunch of, I'm just going to say attorneys because I just, you know, called, uh, what is it about you that's going to make them click and then read on? They still may not go to you, but you want them to at least click on your profile and read about you. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's the job of the headshot is to capture their attention enough it, it brings curiosity to them that they yeah. want to at least see if they're if your your business or your services are a fit for them, and and so that's that was the disconnect and uh, you know doing portraits uh, you know and, and any actor will tell you never go to a portrait photographer and and that's why because most portrait photographers are all about their style and their art and not they don't understand how to bring out those emotions in your you yeah. know, character. Yeah. So in jumping to like the example of the lawyer, um, cause there's, I mean, I could spend a whole conversation going off on the actor part, but uh, in now you working with business people, how do you focus? Do you have like an intake process where you have somebody, you know, really get to know a person um, prior to taking their picture, because you're not going to have necessarily, you know, a, a lawyer per se, you know, um, sitting on the beach, <laughs> you know, ta -da! <laughs> like, because there's the professional and I don't know, you're, you're going to tell me there's like that. How much do you show of the person and then the professionalism or is it a combination? So what I um, what I do um, is before they come into my studio, um, especially with entrepreneurs, if it's like a, a, an, a, an, a, a, an attorney, a banker, something that's a firm, then usually I sit down with the HR or someone that's in charge of their marketing. Mm -hmm. And I find out who are you marketing to? Who are your ideal clients? Mm -hmm. What do your ideal clients need to know about you? Mm -hmm. um, where are you going to find them? Are they, are you going to be on LinkedIn? Are you on, um, Facebook? Are you on TikTok? Where, where are they hanging out? Because that tells me what language they speak. You're uh, going to have a more professional look on a LinkedIn than you are your podcast cover, right. you know? Right. Right. So, and then we talk about what do they need to know about you? What's the most important things that they need to know about you right away? Is it that you're knowledgeable? Is that their most important thing? Is their most important thing that you're trustworthy? Is their mm -hmm. most important thing that they can, that you're approachable and that they can come to you and like, Hey, I'm a mess. I need your help. Like what, what is it that your, your clients need to know about you? And then we talk about what, you know, what, what colors, are your branding colors and why and what other colors can we incorporate into that to give them these feelings and um what what do you need to know and then getting the the job of the camera is to capture emotions and this is the biggest mistake people make when they go to get headshots or pro professional uh, photography done is they are like so caught up and oh my god I hope my makeup looks okay I hope I don't look fat I hope my eye doesn't do that weird thing when I smile oh my <laughs> right. god and I have a zit uh, I hope they can photoshop this sit out I can't believe I woke up with a zit oh my god and then that's what they're thinking while I'm taking their picture 
And guess what? When they see their pictures, they're like, meh. Why? Because that picture gives off a sense of insecurity because they were insecure. So what I do is I talk my clients up. Like we're there in front of the camera and I'm like, you're a badass. Like, how does that feel when you close that house? How does that feel when you sign that deal? How does that, you know, and, and get them excited so they forget about, you know, their nose or whatever thing that <laughs> we all have that thing we're self conscious about, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so then the camera can actually capture those emotions. Or, you know, we, we kind of talk about like, it is so nice that my clients know how trustworthy and I just, I care about my clients, you know, and really get that emotion flowing. And it really does translate into, and of course I mix that with different camera angles and different poses and lighting that also it's, it's, it's not, it's manipulation, but in a, in a pure sense, I mean, yeah. we're using science, we're using mm -hmm. subconscious messaging, um, we're using the, to manipulate the emotions of the people that view this. And we do that with, you know, with different camera angles. We do this with different lighting. We do this with, you know, the, the energy and emotion. So, yeah, it's it's been really fun for me because, like I said, I used to think that headshots were so boring and now it's like a challenge and I, I, I'm loving it. I've been I've been really specializing in headshots for almost 10 years now and, and I'm loving it, just absolutely loving it. And it's, it's, I'll be honest, it's easier on my knees. You know, when you're doing kids mm -hmm. and jumping up and down and doing cartwheels, I'm, I'm getting too old for that. <laughs> <Right. Too old. laughs> you said, and I was going to say like everything that you're saying, I'm just on this end smiling because everything you're talking about sounds like you're talking about energy and like vibration. It's, mm -hmm. you know, you put it out and this is the energy that's put out and it's something like electricity uh, until it shows up in a light actually going on. You can kind of feel it, but you, you kind of are trusting that it's there until the light goes on. It's kind of like getting the photograph. Yeah. When a person's feeling a certain way and then all of a sudden the person's like, oh, I don't know. I, I don't like it for a certain reason because you were feeling crappy. Mm -hmm. when when you took it like you like you weren't in a good headspace yourself and when you said in the beginning using your words like i nerd out about colors i think it's incredible because all of this is part of what you do it's like your your talents and everything that you look at and take into consideration and realize that it's all important it's all a part of the piece of the puzzle that's it, it, exactly. And, you know, that's why so many people say, oh, I hate all my pictures, but my friend took a picture of me at this party and I love that picture. Well, that's because you were having fun at the party. You weren't worried about your hair or your nose or your eye. You were you were having fun and it shows. Um, that's yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah. You're not like standing there awkwardly like, okay, mm -hmm. hand on my hip or, okay, right? let's do this. Oh, let's try that again. <laughs> That's, I, I wasn't, let me get my hair. It just went in my face. It's like, oh my God. It's like completely overthinking it all. Absolutely. And I am the worst getting my pictures taken. So I get it. I get it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So that's a really good segue into learning a little bit more about you and how you actually, for you, Peggy, incorporate more creativity into your own life. So I think that being creative gives me control over the outcome of my life um, because I feel like I can take charge of my the way the way I perceive things and I can be creative like if something looks really terrible happening in my life I have that's my responsibility do I fall apart or do I get creative and do I like, you know, make something out of this mess? Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I think being creative is all about getting up. I mean, if you think mm -hmm. about creative creation, you know, creation usually comes out of pain, right? Like when you give birth to a baby, there's a lot of pain there. Mm -hmm. When you give birth to a project, you're an artist, you know, like there's that mm -hmm. moment where you're like, this is horrible. What am I? Oh my God, it's gorgeous, right? Yes. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and I think that's the magic of, you know, being creative is that we can take charge and I think everybody is creative, whether of it, whether it's in art or or if it's in business or if it's, you know, just in, you know, whatever areas. I think I think human beings are creative people. Period. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's artistic or, or not artistic, I, I think everyone is creative. And out of that, out of that pain, you know, we, we birth this, this beautiful thing. And I think when we, when we decide to be creative and create something with it, then we're, we're allowed to make something beautiful out of our life. You know what I mean? So it's permission. Um, well, I call myself <laughs> a creativity doula. And in that, it's exactly that. It's it's the birthing process of an idea and bringing something that didn't exist and now exists into the world. And it's that whole breaking it down into the stages of inception, which is hopefully fun in the right. sense that the idea drops in or the creation in whatever way it gets created. And then when the idea is in you, it's like, okay, well, now I'm nurturing it and I'm taking care of it. And then I'm kind of scared shitless because... How am I going to actually get this out? <laughs> There's a lot of discomfort, but excitement and nurturing and blah, blah, blah. And then it's time to, when the idea is being birthed, there, it can go a few different ways with the idea. It's You're going through a ton of constriction and expansion and all of this until it gets out. There can be a lot of discomfort and excitement. Uh, and then boom, it's out and then you're nurturing it and growing it. Or you cut it off and say, no, that's too scary. Yeah. I can't do it. It doesn't feel good. And it stays in you, but it's still alive in you. <laughs> Even though you didn't get it out, it's still in you. And that's where, to me, it can cause a lot of um, frustration and anger. Right. That can, that can cause pain, right? Because you. Yeah, lots of it. It's yeah. I had I had a child that was three weeks late past their due date. So that's that's a <laughs> Whew, three that's, weeks. That was that's that's frustrating because you're Holy like, hey, crap. I need this. I need this thing out of me. I need this. I I I want to love this thing, but right now I just need it. I just need it out. Well, yeah, three weeks. That's a really that's like a really long time. It's a really long time. It's a really long time. She is twenty eight years old now. Um, and I'm still bitter about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still harboring feelings about yep, all of this. <laughs> I'm still in processing this. Uh, so then, no, really, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm okay. Don't worry. I'm good. Only three extra weeks. It's almost a month. <laughs> no big deal. You know. All that I did for you. Um, well, tell us, before the last question, but tell us a little bit more about things that actually interest you. We know photography and all of this. Um, what do you what do you enjoy doing for you where you can feel expressive? Does it have anything to do with music? Is it going for walks? Is it um, boxing and exercising? What are some things that you do for you for outlets to express besides photography? So I think uh, I think one of the things I do is I because I I photograph people I photograph you know events um, and sometimes I will just take my camera and and go on a walk and do take pictures of things that I'm not going to sell um, take pictures of you know flowers or something which you know I'm not I'm not even good at it um, <laughs> but it's just kind of my way to you know to to kind of fall back in love and remember um, mm. that, that I, that I, that yes, this is my work, but I do this because I actually love it. A and we have a dog. And let me tell you, this dog is the most spoiled um, dog. <laughs> I think that is my, <laughs> my self care. Um, I, you yeah. know, he's super smart and I love training him um, and, and watching him do just crazy things. Um, mm. you know. So um, I, I don't, uh, I don't, and I used, I used to have a really hard time with it because every time I would find a hobby, it would turn into something I made money with. Like, mm -hmm. you know, when my youngest was little, I, I started scrapbooking with Photoshop and then I started selling these really cool things to my clients, you know, these like posters with their pictures. And stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, but, but I think that's really what I do is, uh, I, I, my husband and I like to travel. Um, we don't travel as, as much as, as we probably should, but we're kind of mm -hmm. getting, I have a grandbaby now, very new thing, very three months old. Um, wow. So congratulations. Definitely, definitely. Like every chance we get, we go up to Northern California and, uh, and get lots of hugs and kisses. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thank you for bringing up. I think it's important where you differentiate because it's like that hobby and then feeling like you turn it into a business. And everybody, I think it's important to understand that this part, when I ask this question, how do you, you know, incorporate creativity into your own life? This is self, it is, it's nurturing. It's just for you. It, it's not about turning it into something else. And like when you mentioned about the dog and travel and being, having a grandbaby and these aspects, these are things that even if it's one thing, some people have 20 things that you have in your life that nurture you and fill you up and realize that you need, it is, it is necessary to take this time to be able to fill yourself up, to have this to have you to remember, like you said, with the photography and going and doing something that isn't what you're known for, but reminds you why you do it. Yeah. And I, I was, I was really bad at, at nurturing myself. Um, mm -hmm. That was an area that I've, that I've, you know, really had to prioritize uh, the last few years. And I realized that, you know, um, how important it is and how how much I wished I would have known that long before <laughs> my age. I wish yeah. that was something I would have prioritized, you know, earlier on. I understand that totally because I tend to do that too. I It's usually about family or the business and all that. Uh, my My 19 year old is constantly reminding me. Um, if we play a game of, well, you know, we would do before we went to sleep for a while, you know, three things you're grateful for, and uh -huh. it would always be about the business. <laughs> and she'd say, <laughs> and before we'd even start, she'd look at me and say, you're not allowed to say anything about the business. I'm like, but I love what I do. <laughs> she said, nope, it has to be something for just you. And I was like, huh, it's just interesting coming from another perspective and especially from your child. Mm -hmm. Where it was like, you're exactly right. Cause it's not all about that there. It's about being more well-rounded and, um, prioritizing self. And that's, it is true. It is true. And it's, I used to uh, edit, uh, photos in my, in my bed because, um, I don't know. And my son used to get so upset with me. He would say, studies have shown that when you work in your room, you can't work in your room. And mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, but. I'm comfortable here and it's not work. I love it. It's, you know, right. Yeah. It, but it took me <laughs> so long to like move my, my home office out of my bedroom. Um, but I realized that, you know, first of all, um, my kids are seeing a problem here. <laughs> Aren't they so smart? They're, They're seeing so a problem smart. here. Yeah. So I should probably listen. God damn, when you raise smart, I intelligent know. children. I know. <sighs> so do you have any kind of a either morning or evening routine for yourself? I do. Um, so my husband and I, um, many years ago, started doing this. Um, he used to meditate every morning. And I was like, yeah, I really do that meditation thing. And then he was like, that's fine. You know, he would go downstairs and meditate. And finally I was like, all right, I kind of feel like I'm missing out on something here. So it's like, let me try this. So I was like listening to like meditation lessons and <laughs> you know, all this. Um, mm -hmm. But now for many, many years, we get up in the morning and we meditate. We have this thing where we don't look at our cell phones um, first thing in the morning. Um, mm -hmm. We, we um, meditate and then we say affirmations um, we kind of have a list of affirmations that we say um, over our relationship and our family. Um, and then um, then we shower and I, I have a condition called lymphedema, which I have to spend about an hour every morning taking care of my legs, doing lymphatic massage and deep breathing, which is nice because it's 
kind of part of my self-care thing. And then we're allowed to look at our phones, you know, once we, so that's kind of my, and then at night we say affirmations. It's the first thing we do in the morning and the last thing we do before we go to bed. Um, we say affirmations over our, over our relationship, over our family. And I think that it really centers us because even if it's really hard to be mad at somebody when you have to say like <laughs> nice things, you know, affirmations with each other. Um, so it, it kind of, even if we are, you know, having, you know, an argument about something or irritated with one another, it kind of, kind of brings that to like, okay, let's, let's think about the big picture where we need to like focus and get, get our life back on track here. So it's, I, I really believe one of the reasons why our relationship is so strong because we do take that time. Wow. So even that's really freaking impressive. And I love that. Actually, I really, the fact that it's affirmations together as a couple, that's so powerful. Like, even if you're, an, even if you've had an argument, you still do it. We do not go to sleep um, without doing it. And it, like, there are times where it's like, fine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're like starting because we say the first affirmation together and then I I say a line and he says a line and in the morning it's the opposite you know and uh, um, so there's times especially in the evening where it'll start off oh, fine I'm going to bed let's say our words and, <laughs> and then by the end we're like I love you Aww. you That's... really upset me or you hurt my feelings or you know but it's kind of it's really tough it's really tough to say these things and then still stay mad. So, well, because then you, God, I just love that so much. Because when you vocalize, there are times I can say where I'm like stewing over something and I haven't said it out loud, but I'm thinking of like if it's, you know, towards my husband and I'm just kind of like, ah, you know, something that's annoying me. And then I said, oh, look, we have to talk. And then we sit down and then I look him in the eye and we're saying it. And I'm like, that sounds really dumb. Like, right. When, like when, I, when I said it out loud, it seemed a lot bigger in my head. It does. <laughs> Always. Always. Dramatic. And it seemed like I was right there. But this doesn't seem. Like I knew in my head, I had this fight with you for like 30 minutes and I won each time. And now right. I'm saying it out loud and geez, I feel like a jerk. Yeah, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> that's funny. Oh my gosh, such a great idea, everybody! What a great takeaway. You literally do not go to bed angry. Well, I mean, I'm not going to say that we've never gone to bed angry, but it this definitely reduces the number. Of times. Well, yeah, and it's the attempt. It's kind of like it's not just getting into bed and just kind of turning right. your back. And because like you said, in many other things, it's, it's the emotion that we carry. And it really is like how we carry emotion um, in our lives in showing up in a photograph or just showing up in any way. It's, it takes a toll on our bodies. Um, it does. It does. It's, it's like using our power for good. <laughs> Exactly. I always say it's like use your power for good and when there was one situation where um I don't know if this has to completely do but for some reason it just made me think of it I dropped my daughter off at work and I pulled into um this parking this driveway just for a second she jumped out of the car and then all of a sudden my daughter's like there's a whole bunch of cars backed up and they're honking I'm like well it doesn't have to do with me whatever. I had the music on and then I backed up and I'm like, oh my God, it's totally my fault. Like she wanted to, <laughs> she wanted to pull into the driveway and then apparently uh -huh. I was walking. Yeah. Um, so I pulled away and I just kind of waved like, thank you. Sorry. And I wasn't listening. I was listening to my music and kind of dancing along. And when I picked up our daughter later, she's like, oh my God, she was completely cursing you out. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I was so angry at her because she was cursing you out. I'm like, whatever. Like, it was a second, or yeah, a few seconds. It really, what's the big deal? But my daughter was so pissed. So funny. 
Oh and that gosh. goes back to how you perceive things. Like in your world, it wasn't that big of a deal. In her world, it was like you. She probably carried that all day long. Like, why? Right, right. She was probably, and she's a business owner. And oh. <laughs> my daughter's like, "How could you be a business owner?" And like, da da da. I'm like, whatever. Again, I'm just in my happy space of listening to my music. It doesn't right. really affect me. But it is all about perception. You're exactly right. That's, so that's as awesome. we're getting to the top of the hour, which is nuts, um, the third and final question is, it kind of is a little repetitive, but kind of wraps it up, which is, why do you think creativity is important? So I'm dyslexic. We didn't mention this before. So the way my brain works, I sometimes connect things that that other people don't connect and I don't know I think that sometimes if people just take a moment to think about things and look outside the box which that's what creativity is right is looking outside the box mm -hmm. that they'll see such a bigger more amazing world I think it's it's boring to do something just because that's the way somebody told you to do it. I I remember when I was in high school, I told my dad, um, my dad's dyslexic. My my grandfather never did learn to read. My dad learned to read when I did. Um, wow. Wow. Um, yeah, I was 13 before I learned how to read. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember in high school telling him, and this is horrible, I said, I just you know, it's a teenage thing. I, I just hate you. I wish you hadn't made me dumb like you. That's, that's what I said to him. Uh, mm -hmm. And, um, I moved out of the house when I was 18. I went and interned in, um, Tulsa, Oklahoma with portraits by Kevin, Kevin Hurdlebrink. He was the photographer that I interned with. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of my first time ever being on my own, ever being in if you can call Tulsa, Oklahoma, a big city, that was a big city for me from where I came from. Mm -hmm. And being in, you know, and I remember calling him just a few months later and saying, dad, thank you for making me dumb like you. I don't know how I would survive in this world if I were one of those smart people. I don't know how they tie their own shoe in the morning. <laughs> and, and I think that's, people get so, caught up in knowing how it's done that they don't look to see how else it could be done. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we would just take the time to see um, how other people do things and have discussions with other people about why, instead of being mad that it's different, we would all learn so much about ourselves and about the world. And I think a lot of, a lot of the anger and hate could maybe diminish with some curiosity and uh, wonder in this amazing amount of diversity that we have in our world. God, that's so beautiful. To that word curiosity, it's everything you just said. I'm just like, wow, 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 wow. It just really is truly so outside of the the box and listening. And it, it just made me think of, well, you were like, okay, I'm not sure how to do something. I'm not sure why I'm capturing this. So I'm going to go take an acting class because you were curious. You wanted to know more. I, I was pissed. I didn't like, my ego was bruised. Let's be honest. <laughs> it was, but yes. you could have stayed pissed. Like right. You, you could have just stayed pissed and just been like, nobody understands me. I'm a photographer that, and I get, I'm good at this and blah, blah, blah. It's kind of like, and nobody understands me and I'm just going to be angry at the world. Like you could have done that, but you were amped up enough to be curious, to be like, okay, so what am I missing? Yes. You put yourself through it. And I learned a lot. And now, believe it or not, I love doing headshots, which is something I never thought I would say 10 years ago. It was like, you know, isn't that funny? 
it's just always funny. Like so often it's these directions when we're open to these directions and not having everything planned out, not being in the box and being like, okay, well, when, um, after I graduate college, I'm going to get this job and then I'm going to get married and then I'm going to have 2.5 kids and then I'm going to live here. And then I'm going to do that. Like when you're open to like, I don't know, let's see, or the wonder and the curiosity it's then who knows what things will bring. And that's right. Because we always have a vision that our vision often changes once we once we start moving. It's it's about moving, right? It's about getting up when you fall down and just keeping moving. Keep that yeah. movement going. Oh my gosh. So Peggy, how can people connect with you? Um, they can go to Headshots by Peggy and they can click on connect with me and just call and chat with me for a few minutes and see how I can help you or direct you to somebody um, in your area that has gone through my amazing program. I'm, I'm, I'm building a community of amazing photographers. Mm -hmm. We just launched, so it may be a minute before we get there, but we are on that road. I am so excited for you. Gosh, thank you so much. What were you going to say? I, I was going to say, I'm really excited too. And I'm at that point because you said, you know, the, the whole, the whole, you know, doula where you're at that point where it's like oh this is like stretching and it's kind of uncomfortable I'm, I'm kind of at that point it's yeah. like oh i i did it i created it now i've got to market it and ew. yeah <laughs> so i'm reframing that like this is fun this is the next fun thing i get to learn yeah so, yeah i yeah. really appreciate you asking me on your podcast this was so much fun to chat with you oh thank you such a great conversation um so appreciate everything that you're putting into the world and your light and your vulnerability and your share. Um, before we say goodbyes, is there anything else that's top of mind or you feel like you forgot before we say goodbye? I don't think so. I think we had a really fun conversation. I mean, mm -hmm. I yeah. it, it felt like it was like five minutes. I looked down at my clock and I was like, how has it been an hour? But I, I like how everything kind of went around in a full circle. You know, we were talking about, you know, vulnerability and getting back up and dreams and create, you know, how creativity, I, I just, it was a really fun time. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. It always works out that way. And that's, that's the beauty of it. Everybody, right. Is being open and <laughs> there's structure, but there's openness being open to the to the possibilities being getting outside the box. So everybody, this space is all about inspiring each other, sharing, um, sharing stories and connection. I believe we've always needed this, but I truly believe now we need it more than ever. Yes. More than ever. So please like, follow, share all of that good stuff. So we can just share this goodness with everybody who needs to hear it so we can feel empowered and lifted up and more connection. So on that note, wherever you are listening, I wish you a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. And uh, we'll talk again soon. So goodbye, everybody. Bye. Feeling inspired? Let's just get rid of this, throw away this whole perfectionism thing, this whole concept that we have to know how to do everything. You know what? You don't. <laughs> Let's just do things and try things and realize what we like and what we don't like. It's all part of the process. The self-awareness feels so good. You feel more connection to yourself, connection to others, and huh? be a happier, more joyful person. Just imagine that. So you are where you are in the process. So you can dip your toe in the water to try new things at a slower pace, or you can dive right in. Here at I Am Creative and Express Yourself Publishing, we meet you where you are. So there are so many ways to check us out. Explore our experiential kits. They have everything in them that you need to try new things. You don't have to buy anything else but this kit and just explore. There's Creative Shui, which is seven elements to join happiness. Through the Publishing House, Express Yourself Publishing, multi-author books, coffee books, solo book opportunities. It is all about expression, all about it. And it's, again, just trying these things and realizing what you're good at. Don't all of a sudden think that you only fit into one box because we don't. We are not made for boxes. <laughs> there is also my TV show, I Am Creative. 
check it out. The links are all in the body of this podcast. You can just click the link. And you know what? Don't say, oh, maybe I'll check it out tomorrow. Life's too short. Just click it. See what it's about. There is honestly no judgment. It's all about exploring the possibilities, expressing yourself, and expanding your thinking. I will give you the website, which is IamCreativePhilly.com. So I am creative Philly, P-H-I-L-L-Y dot com. And just remember that you are an expressive being, so own it. I am looking forward to hearing your story because we all have one.